Good morning, good morning. Good to see all your smiling faces this morning. So, do we have any baseball fans in the house? A few, right? Okay, do we have any Met fans in the house? All right, so that's good, that's good. And we're clapping right now, which is good. So, uh, I, I will tell you, you know, we've been in the soundtrack series and I've been thinking about the soundtracks that are, are difficult to stay positive with and one of them is my life as a Met fan because I became a Met fan in 1986, if you know, you know. And uh, October 25th, actually, 1986, again, if you know, you know. And, uh, and uh, since then, it's been a life of hardship and misery. So uh, the Mets this season had a terrific season, but then at the, at the end of the season, they kind of drag us Met fans through, you know, heartache, uh, wondering what's gonna happen. They've got a chance to clinch their division uh, if they win just one out of three games against the Atlanta Braves a couple weeks ago, and they, they got swept, they lost all three, and it's like, oh, oh no, they eke their way into the playoffs and find themselves in an elimination game last night, and again, drag us through a little heartache, but they won, yes, um, and uh, let's not clap too much because they have to do it again tonight in order to, uh, to, to advance. So, you know, after they got swept by the Braves last week, this was only like six days ago, all right, the press goes up to Buck Showalter, who is their manager, and they're, they're, they're giving him a pretty hard time. They're, they're basically asking him, like, you know, how does it feel to be a choke artist, <laughs> is, my is my paraphrase. And um, Buck Showalter says this. He says, I haven't gotten into that negative vibe. He says, I think everybody wants to know how somebody feels when things aren't going their way. And what I've reminded them, the team, and will remind them is how good they are and how good a year they've had. And we will still get a chance to accomplish our goals. And he said, they've earned something regardless, and I'm proud of everything they've done. And that support is unconditional, not conditional. I was like, oh, Buck, <laughs> that's beautiful, right? Uh, I was like, that's, it's moving. And, and it's because the power of positivity, you know, research has been done on this for decades, that the power of positivity has the ability to, to change the way we behave, it changed the energy that's within us. People with a more positive mindset have been found to be able to tolerate like up to 50% uh, more pain than one with a negative attitude. So I've got two kids, I won't tell you which is which, but one of them can have 104 fever and not say a word and just pound through, and the other one will sneeze one time and he's like, oh, somebody help me. Right? But somehow positive thinking plays a role in that. People who have a positive mindset on uh, life experience are 85% less likely to suffer from depression or anxiety. Optimists have a 19% lower risk uh, of early death than a pessimist. So I guess the punchline is be positive. Be kind to yourself. Right? Oh, it's so easy, isn't it? Like I can just say that and then let's pray and get the worship team back out here. Right? If only, if only... It were so simple. And we're in this soundtrack series and uh, thinking about and talking through what does it look like to retire these soundtracks that are in our minds that ring over and over again that haunt us and stifle us and yet we play them over and over again. And uh, we've, been, we've been kind of gathering around verses like what we find in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 where it says we demolish all arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. You know, or, or Romans chapter 12 talks about how, you know, not to conform to the pattern of the world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Right? And we're walking through this reality that this is something that God is inviting us toward and it is something that he is desiring to do in us and through us as he changes the way that we think. Now, there are more layers to the wiring in our minds than we might even realize, you know. Trevor was talking last week about how, how you, even neurologically, how your mind begins to change when you practice positivity. And there are a lot of factors that play into that. 
our, our, our family of origin. Science shows us that there's, there's an intergenerational element to it. That, that the hurt and the trauma that even our parents and their parents have experienced, it, it flows through and, and affects us. Um, you know, some of us, so many of us come from a, a, a culture in which um, the things that we experience, the way that behave, that we behave, does not, it's not just limited to us, right? It either brings honor or shame to our families in so many ways, is what we've been taught. And um, that concept of honor and shame and our own experiences and the hurt that we've experienced gets so woven into the soundtracks that play in our minds. So what we've been looking at as we've been going through this series is this. We've been asking these three questions when we think about retiring old soundtracks. We've been asking, is it true? Uh, Robert talked with us about that a couple of weeks ago. Is it helpful? Trevor talked about that with us last week. If you missed either of those two, I'd encourage you to have a listen uh, online. And today we're going to take a look at this. Is it kind? Are the soundtracks that roll around in our minds, are they kind? In order for us to be able to even wrap our heads around this, I think we need to get a sense of what it is that we're talking about. So what does an unkind soundtrack even sound like? Well, when something's untrue and it's unhelpful, it's almost invariably in kind, unkind, because that which is kind is also going to be true. Why, what do I mean by that? Because there's no kindness in deceit. And when we are lying to ourselves and untrue things are rolling around in our heads, that is inherently unkind. And, and that which is true oftentimes also brings benefit, right? It's helpful. But it is possible for something to be true, something to be helpful, and still for us to be unkind to ourselves. Let's unpack this a little bit. It's because unkind soundtracks in our minds, it's, it, it's a, they devolve. It's, it's a journey, actually. We see it in the scriptures. We see it in our own experience. It's this unkind evolution where thoughts mutate from I haven't done enough to I am not enough. It's from what I haven't done enough that I've done something bad to I am bad. And this is the concept that both the scriptures and social scientists call shame. Is it true and is it helpful might pertain to some objective realities, but whether or not a thought, a soundtrack in our mind is kind often relates to our own view of ourselves. And we notice it. And if we're willing to do the hard work of, of digging beneath a layer or two of what it is that we're feeling on the surface, we notice that we're being unkind to ourselves because we were actually created for a different soundtrack. And, and I, I've always felt like in order to really see the good news of Jesus Christ and what it is that he, accompl he has accomplished and is accomplishing and will accomplish, it's sometimes helpful to take a look of, at what it is that he intended for us all along. So we're going to go back to our first couple of pages of the Bible again. It takes us right there. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, it says this. It says, so God created mankind in his own image. Um, in the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God saw all that he had made, and he sees, and he says, it's very good. Um, chapter later, we see that Adam and his wife were both naked and felt no shame. All right, so if you're new here or new to the scriptures, it sounds like a little bit of a weird sentence, like naked and no shame, unashamed, like what is this? That's a weird thing to find in the Bible. It is, I, I believe, one of the most profound concepts that you'll find in the scriptures because it paints this picture of what it is that God intended for us where they were living in this state where there was nothing to hide from one another and nothing to hide from God. They were living in this confidence that they belonged in that place. They, they, they're living in this assurance that they're worthy of love from God and from one another. That they're feeling secure. They're feeling safe. And all of that sounds amazing, doesn't it? It's, it's what we were made for. The soundtrack in the garden, the soundtrack for what we were created for, it was marked by truth. It was marked by that which is helpful and is marked by kindness. So if you know how the story goes, Adam and Eve, they, they, uh, they end up deciding that 
God's definition of good and evil is not good enough for them, so they redefine good and evil for themselves. And they find themselves in chapter 3, verse 7, where it says, the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized that they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. So what happens here is that they go from this state of being naked and unashamed to covering themselves with fig leaves and being full of shame. Shame enters the scene. Because in that moment, when they had done something wrong, they didn't go to the character of who they knew God to be. Knowing God to be one who is compassionate, one who is gracious, one who is slow to anger, one that is full of love and so faithful. They didn't run toward God's character, but instead they ran and hid. And the reason for that, as Brene Brown, a social scientist, would say it, is because shame is the intensely painful feeling or experience of believing that we are flawed and therefore unworthy of acceptance and belonging. Or stated a little more simply by J.R. Briggs, it's the terrible fear of being unloved. And, and there's a lot to unpack here because there is guilt that comes as a result of having done something wrong. And there's a little bit of a difference between guilt, and guilt does lead to shame. And there's, there's a healthy shame that actually comes about that leads us to what it is that the gospel has accomplished for you and for me. We're going to talk more about that in a second. But there is this distinction between guilt and shame, where guilt says we did something bad, and shame says is the soundtrack, the unkind soundtrack in our mind that says I am bad. Guilt says... I didn't do what I needed to do today. And shame says I'm lazy. When we talk to our kids, guilt says your room is messy even though you're, you're supposed to clean it. And shame says you're a messy kid. Guilt says you did something irresponsible. Shame says you are irresponsible. It strips a person of the complexity of their story and who they were created to be and relegates them to this new identity. And guilt leads us to repentance. Guilt is the thing that says, yes, I've done something bad, but I can cling and move towards the character of God. Whereas shame, just as it did with Adam and Eve, what does it cause them to do? It causes them to hide. And you might say, well, I think I'm good because I don't actually acutely feel this sense of shame that you're talking about. I don't walk around feeling like I'm bad or I'm, I'm unlovable or inadequate in some way. I don't feel that acutely. When I, I, and I would just say, wait a second. Because I think that when we think about what these unkind soundtracks are in our mind and how they affect us, and we're willing to do just a little bit of work and dig just one or two layers beneath the surface, I think that we will find that shame creeps in in ways that we that are hard for us to even see on the surface. And we've got some examples of script, in Scripture of this. Um, and I think that in order for us to understand what an unkind soundtrack sound like, well, it sounds like shame, but to reframe it, I think we need to also recognize what it does to us. Stephen Tracy said this, shame distorts the reality by going beyond convicting us that we've done bad things and need to be forgiven. It whispers to us that we are bad and unforgivable. So what does an unkind soundtrack do to us? So in the earlier part of this series, we were following the story of Saul a little bit, Saul and David. Um, we started out talking about how David um, kills Goliath. Saul becomes really jealous, and he starts chasing him because he's afraid that David's going to take his throne. He's got all these soundtracks rolling around in his head. Uh, eventually, David does, in fact, become king, and he becomes one of the most successful kings in the history of Israel. Uh, and though he's winning all of these battles and he's loved by the people, he's also feeling a bit crushed by the weight of, uh, of that role of leading God's people. And in Psalm 69, he writes a poem about this. And let's take a look at it. Psalm 69. What does an unkind soundtrack do to us? Well, let's see what it did to David. Psalm 69, verse 1. It says, Save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. I sink in the miry depths where there is no foothold. I have come into the deep waters. The floods engulf me. I am worn out, calling for help. 
My throat is parched. My eyes fail looking for my God. Okay, wow. He is having a bad day. Am I right? I mean, think about what it is that he's feeling and what it is that he's writing about. He's feeling like he's sinking to the depths with no foothold. It's this idea of kind of like drowning and feeling like there's nothing to grab onto to, to pull you back up. He says, floods engulf me. It's like there's no control over what's happening around me as these waters are coming up. He say, it's like, I tried calling out to you, God, and I'm feeling like that's not working and I'm, I'm tired even of that. He is not in a good place. He is struggling with some hardship. But take a look at what happens next. Something about his view of his hardships begins to change and form into an unkind soundtrack in his mind. Take a look at what he says next in verse 4. Those who hate me without reason outnumber the hairs of my head. Many are my enemies without cause. Those who seek to destroy me, I am forced to re restore what I did not steal. You, God, know my folly. My guilt is not hidden from you. Do you see what's happening here? This is starting to transform his thinking. From his hard situation and his difficult circumstances, he begins self-loathing. And his reality begins to get redefined. This is what unkind soundtracks do to us. All of a sudden, the, he transitions to those who hate me outnumber the hairs on my head. He's in this posture of like, everybody hates me. And he was one of the most popular and, and successful kings in Israel's history. He, he, he gets this... This sense, this identity, I'm a duplicitous person. He says, but you, God, know my folly and my guilt is not hidden from you. And then that guilt, which distorted his reality, it starts to morph into his feeling completely unlovable. Verse 19 and 20 says, you know how I am scorned. I'm disgraced and shamed. All my enemies are before you. Scorn has broken my heart and has left me helpless. I looked for sympathy, but there was none. No comforters. I found none. It's like I'm completely unlovable. How could anybody possibly care about me? And you're watching this metamorphosis happen in his mind. What started as a difficulty became this unkind soundtrack that just developed and developed and it turned in to self-loathing. And then that feeling of being unlovable leaves him feeling so bad that he will naturally bring harm to others. Look what he says. Lord, the Lord Almighty, may those who hope in you not be disgraced because of me, God of Israel. May those who seek you not be put to shame because of me, because of my condition, because of my state, because of how unlovable I am, I'm invariably going to bring harm to the people around me. This is the effect of our unkind soundtracks on ourselves and on others. You know, this book is, this uh, series is largely based on this book by John Acuff called Soundtracks. And uh, he goes through this example of how um, he had always felt like Good parents don't travel for work because his parents didn't travel for work. And because he had to travel for work, he started talking about how he would do this whole thing with his kids. I'm so sorry I have to leave and, and make this whole production. He'd buy them tons of gifts and, and he would create this whole thing just operating out of his place of shame that good parents don't travel for work. And therefore, since I'm traveling for work, I am a bad parent. And he starts operating out of that, that place of shame. And what he starts to realize and what he writes about is how unkind that soundtrack is and how it affects both him and others. The unkindness of, of that determination of himself that I'm a bad parent because I have to travel for work, as well as the unkindness that it brings about to the people around him. It doesn't, doesn't serve his wife well for him to rile up his kids and bring them into a frizzy and then leave. And she has to pick up the aftermath. It doesn't benefit his kids all that much to, to, to talk with them as if work is a bad thing and the fact that he has to travel is a bad thing when in fact it's just part of the rhythm of their life in that season. Unkind soundtracks completely reshape our reality such that unkindness and that shame makes it difficult for us to be truly happy for someone else because their accomplishment reminds us of our own failures. It makes it difficult for us to um, have a good, enjoyable experience because there's something down in the core of us that somehow reinforces this belief that we don't deserve 
good things. And the unkind soundtrack is that we're unlovable and therefore undeserving. The Thai word for shame literally means to tear one's own face off and just to appear ugly before their friends and family as if we'd be more comfortable that way. It's this default position of our hearts in a broken world. But the story does not end there. The story does not end with the unkind soundtracks that are playing in our minds that say we are unlovable or that we are unworthy. Because the gospel reorients our unkind soundtracks. Because listen, you were created for honor, not shame. You were created for honor, not shame. Every word in the language of Genesis chapter 1 and 2, as it paints this picture of who God created humans to be, is language of royalty. It's language of honor. And after that gets all messed up, and then Jesus comes and he dies and he rises again, all of the language as it relates to humanity is that which relates to honor, not shame. That you are children of God. It's royalty language. You are heirs and co-heirs with Christ. It's honor. It's royalty language. This is what the gospel the gospel does. But that honor does not originate with us. David's on the right track, actually, in this psalm, because he's struggling. He's going through all of this hardship. His thought process is devolving into that place of self-loathing and of shame. But in the midst of that hardship, in the midst of that, in 69 verse 13, he starts praying, and he prays like this. He says, but I pray to you, Lord, in the time of your favor. In your great love, O God, answer me. With your sure salvation, rescue me. You have to do that. I cannot rescue myself from the mire. Do not let me sink. You have to do that. Deliver me from those who hate me from the deep waters. He begins to understand and appreciate that, yes, he is made for honor, but that honor does not come from within him. That it's not a matter of him trying to find and muster the strength to say, I am somebody. But instead, appreciating and understanding that his honor comes from a source outside of himself. And in the midst of that hardship, in the midst of that very unkind soundtrack that was playing in his mind, that went from I'm having a hard time, to I am unlovable and unworthy, to I am going to do harm to everybody that comes around me. In the midst of that, in that moment, he starts to appreciate that there is somebody outside of himself that replaces that unkind soundtrack with one that says, you are made for honor. Now, From David, from his line, from his seed, from David's faithfulness, we get Jesus. And Jesus, at the center of the gospel, Peter writes about it like this. He says, you are coming to Christ, who is the living cornerstone, God's temple. He was rejected by people, but he was chosen by God for great what? Honor. He says, and you are living stones. You are living stones that God is building into his spiritual temple. What's more, you are his holy priests. Through the mediation of Jesus Christ, you offer spiritual sacrifices that please God. As the scriptures say, I am placing a cornerstone in Jerusalem, chosen for great what? Honor. And anyone who trusts him will never be disgraced. Some translations say, will never be put to shame. Because, yes, you who trust him recognize the honor God has given him. Listen, is there this sort of healthy guilt that actually leads to shame? We saw it with with, um, Adam and Eve, where yes, they did something wrong and they found themselves in a state that is actually, in fact, Uh, unworthy of being back in the presence of God. But what do we see right from the outset? 
We see the God who is slow to anger, who's full of love, who's full of faithfulness, who's full of compassion, coming into the garden saying, where are you? And coming after them. Because this is what the gospel does with our guilt and with our shame. It points out that our worthiness and our lovability is not our own, but it comes from a source outside of ourselves. You know, it, 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 this all sounds very good, right? It's like, okay, so I'm being unkind to myself. Um, uh, I'm allowing my guilt to form into shame. I, I'm, I'm living in this, this idea, this notion, um, depending on, even on your cultural background, this notion that when I, when I do something wrong, when I fail in some way, it, it brings shame upon my family. When my kids fail, it brings shame upon me. When I fail, it brings shame upon my parents. And it affects my entire family in one way or another. And we start to let these, these soundtracks just get louder and get louder and get louder. And yes, this sounds wonderful. There's this source from outside of ourselves that, that, that renews that and says, no, no, no. You are lovable. You are worthy of honor, but it's not your honor. It's the honor of Jesus placed upon you. Now, all of that sounds good, but how do we actually claim that reality? How do we let that permeate the corners and the darkest crevices of our heart, the darkest crevices of our mind? How do we allow for this truth to turn down that dial that says you are not good enough and turn up the dial that says you are good enough because God's goodness is on you and is in you and is flowing through you? Well, I think David was actually on the right track. Because when I think of one of the ways that we do that, it is through this ancient practice of prayer. And we will talk more about this in the weeks to come. David prayed in the moment that he was experiencing the depths of this unkind soundtrack. The more unkind it was getting, he starts finally to lean towards God. That's when he says, like we looked at a moment ago, I pray you, Lord, in the time of your favor and your great love, answer me with your sure salvation. And we, family, we have got a beautiful, profound book of prayers right in the middle of our Bibles where we've got uh, the book of Psalms full of David and other psalmists in their most authentic hardships. Two-thirds of the Psalms are lament. It's hardship. And in the midst of that hardship, we've got prayers of people saying, no, 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 my shame is not what's going to define me. But actually the honor of God who loves me is what's going to define me. What would it look like for us family to begin to pray that way. Maybe we, maybe we use the Psalms. We've got this prayer book in our Bibles right in the middle. What would it look like maybe for us individually, with our families, with our small groups, whoever it might be, to maybe pray through some of these Psalms together? This is not a matter of trying to do more. I don't know about you. I try to change my own mindset many times. And I will say this, it can work for a minute. It could work for a day. It could work for a couple of days. But in my experience, it is not sustainable. If I just try to will myself into, oh, you know what, Justin, you're being negative. Just turn it around. I'll be like, you know what? Yeah, I'll think I'll turn it around. And I think I do that for a minute. But a couple of days later, I find myself right back to where I was, either about that thing that it was or about something else altogether. Because so much of this comes about through practice, through practicing these rhythms of identifying the unkindness that's going on in your mind and choosing in that moment to call upon God, pray as you can. It doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to be as beautiful as the way David says it. You pray as you can. Because what happens then when we practice that is that it begins to change our mind. It begins to change our heart. It begins to draw upon a power that's outside of ourselves. Dallas Willard says, grace is not opposed to effort. Grace is opposed to earning. It's with practice and effort and that, that, that exercise of, you, of making a choice that I am not going to live in the darkness of that unkind soundtrack that's in my, in my mind, but instead I am going to call out to God. Just start there. That in prayer we would call out to God. We mature in this way by training, by practicing that. 
I heard an example recently thinking about like if we wanted to learn how to play the piano, we, we don't just like grit our teeth on one day and just like try harder on the playing, right? That is not going to get you there. You learn how to play the piano not by trying, but by training, by practicing those rhythms and letting that start to affect the muscles, the muscle memory of how your fingers move. And this is what, this is what we're invited into. We're invited into getting into the rhythms of, of recognizing what's going on in our minds and coming to God and saying, God, I need you to rescue me. I need you to deliver me. So one of these ways that we do that is through this ancient practice of prayer. And if you don't know where to start, I'd encourage you to start with the Psalms and, and pray through the Psalms together. I, I think also it comes about by hearing from others. We hear what God is desiring to say through to us about our, our true worth and our true value through one another. If you're married, marriage is one of the most beautiful portraits of God's profound love and value and desire for you. And, and if you're not even among friends and family and acquaintances, the way that we love one another is so telling. It helps us experience God's, the richness of God's love for us. This is why he didn't leave us alone. This is why he, didn't, he doesn't say that following Jesus is some kind of a solo sport. We experience him. We experience the gospel in community. So what would it look like for us to drudge through sort of the awkwardness of going up to somebody and telling them what you've been thinking about how valuable they are to you and of their true worth. And I know it's awkward and it's uncomfortable. We don't talk like that all the time. But man, God speaks to us through one another. We hear about our true worth and value. As God w is in you and works through you, I get to be the beneficiary of that when you tell me those things. And you get to be the beneficiary of that when I allow for him to be in me and through me and speak to you and remind you that you are not unworthy, you are not unlovable, just the opposite. That you are valued beyond you could possibly imagine. That you are more lovable than you ever thought possible. And it's all been made possible because of a source outside of yourself. And finally, I feel like uh, one of the ways that we allow for these dials to change is to sit with the reality of who God says we are. How do we do that? How do we know who God says we are? Well, fortunately, through his spirit, he wrote a book. And in addition to the ways that we experience it in the things that we feel as we pray and the ways that we hear it when we speak to each other, we hear it in God's word. So I'd invite you, if you would, um, if you would, would you just maybe, maybe close your eyes for a minute or if you want to keep them open, maybe just look down for a second, maybe pick a spot and just look at it for a second. And just listen to these words as they pour over you. See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. You are God's special possession that you might declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. To all who did receive him, to those who believed in the name of Jesus, he gave the right to be called children of God. Family, this is who you are. You are not who your shame says you are, you were bought with a price, the scriptures say. 
You are worth what Jesus was willing to pay. And he paid everything for you. This is what you are worth. This is what I am worth. This is what the good news about Jesus Christ means for you and for me. That those unkind soundtracks that tell us that we're unlovable and unworthy are not the reality. Because you are not defined by shame, but by honor. Let's pray. God, we are so grateful for the power of this reality. God, that we are not marked by shame, but we are marked by honor. That you have made us worthy, you have made us lovable. That all of your goodness and your righteousness and everything about you has been placed on us because Jesus came and he died and he rose again. And God, we are so grateful for the power of that reality. Would you cause us to not listen and turn up the dials of unkindness in our minds that tell us that we are worthless, but that instead we would turn up the dial that says we are worthy of your acceptance and your love because of what you have done for us. Would we call out to you in the moments of our hardship and our sadness and our shame and the unkind thoughts that we have and the unkind soundtracks that we play about ourselves, and instead would we claim this promise every day that you are the one who makes us worthy would we encourage one another with it every day in the regular rhythms of our conversation as we're having coffee outside after service would you meet with us would we be would we just feel and experience your presence more richly as you remind us of who we are in the good news about jesus christ we love you we thank you we pray this in jesus name amen